Hi everyone, I am Katherine Ayers Wickenhauser, Director of Communications at Direct Trust, and I'm so excited today to be joined by Matt Bishop from Open City Labs, one of our most recent interoperability heroes. Matt, welcome. Will you tell us more about yourself and about Open City Labs? Sure. Thank you so much for having me in this honor. Uh, so Open City Lab, so we deliver leading IT technology that connects uh, patients to the full ecosystem of care. So that's healthcare, human services, and government benefits, um, and also connects these providers to one another. And we do this by uh, streamlining closed loop referrals, automating eligibility enrollment in programs and government benefits. And what we've found is that um, by using AI to aggregate information about programs, we can recommend those programs that patients are eligible for, or that uh, a patient might have a need for based on some kind of uh, clinical or social needs assessment tool. Um, and then we can autofill sometimes up to 95% of the data that's required for some of these applications um, uh, for, for, for enrolling in these programs. And, and what stands out about our approach is we, we take approach where we're really looking to bridge the divide across systems, right? Not just act as purely a kind of a walled garden where uh, each organization uh, needs a license to you to make a referral to another organization. We really want to be able to refer across you know, our system to other electronic health records and other systems as well. Um, so our, our software also enables um, clinical and human service providers to deliver kind of more integrated contextualized care um, based on a common um, patient record, um, you know, kind of a, a care management um, model um, while uh, offering functionality to kind of provide a 360 degree view of the patient so that uh, providers can understand the life circumstances, household uh, and family members, um, you know, things like housing and food insecurity, financial insecurity, um, that kind of thing. Um, how did I get here? Uh, I, I got a master's in public administration at Cornell and then right at grad school, I, I worked at uh, Manhattan Psychiatric Center and business uh, office there and a management training program. I later moved on and worked, uh, managed close to $100 million in government uh, contracts to provide social services uh, at an organization called Volunteers of America Greater New York. Um, so I kind of had a front row view of, of seeing when these programs worked and when they didn't work so much. Um, and later taught myself to code, uh, worked for some big firms like PricewaterhouseCoopers and Hearst, for uh, while remaining active uh, in healthcare, was ended up being the youngest person appointed to the governor's healthcare reform advisory council uh, back in 2007. That was so uh, after the Affordable Care Act passed, so advising on the implementation of the ACA um, and worked on legislation to streamline benefits for for various government programs before starting Open Sea Labs when kind of the central idea was recognized as your finalist for a TED talk. I haven't given a, a TED talk yet. We didn't, I didn't get accepted, but uh, we were a finalist. So I thought this might be something worth pursuing. So. Thank you, Matt, for sharing more of your background. Very cool to hear. And your nominator for Interoperability Hero mentioned how important social determinants of health are to you and, and the work that you're doing in this space. And I'm curious if you could share a little bit more, knowing that SDOH is, is such a hot topic right now, why is it important to focus on yeah. now? Absolutely, so the, the, the pandemic has revealed uh, stark inequalities um, in health outcomes. Uh, frontline workers oftentimes you know, are in lower paying jobs and are, are at greater risk. But even before that, uh, you, know, you could just take a subway ride from you know, the Upper East Side to the South Bronx and then a few subway stops, you could see a difference in life expectancy as, as, as great as 15 years in, in uh, big cities like New York or Chicago. Um, so health equity is certainly central to what is going on in healthcare today. Um, and then from a kind of a purely financial perspective, addressing the social determinants of health is good business. Um, you see managed care organizations investing hundreds of millions of dollars of housing homeless patients 
who are frequent flyers in the ER because it's cheaper to pay their rent than it is to pay, you know, one or two or three ER visits. Um, you know, if that diabetic can't, uh, doesn't have a place for, for their, their um, insulin, they can't store it. Uh, they, they're going to have a more likely to have an emergency, uh, you know, incident and have to go to the ER. Um, but more broadly, you've seen the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services investing in the social determinants of health, and we're really um, excited to announce on this call for the first time uh, our partnership with um, the CMS Innovation Grant Program. There's an Integrated Care for Kids Program, which is a value-based care uh, model based on improving the quality of care and reducing the cost of care for children uh, under the age of 21. And we're partnering with the New Jersey recipient uh, Children's Health Ventures, and we're working with them in New Jersey 211, which is the statewide information and referral um, service provider, um, to, we are going to leverage their data, their statewide database of, of community resources, and be the referral eligibility and enrollment um, software for assisting those patients and addressing their clinical and social needs. So we're really excited about that. I mean, just to kind of give you a picture of how important this is nationwide and kind of the opportunity to address social determinants with these types of models. Um, 211's nationwide, they've made, the, as a service in 2020, they made, they received 18.5 million phone calls for non-emergency uh, services, um, 1.5 million texts, and they're funded um, by the United Way. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of really exciting resources that with the right technological infrastructure, you can marry those ex that expertise and really connect healthcare to social care in a big way. Thank you for sharing that announcement with us. That's extremely exciting news. So very interested to hear more and see what comes from Open City Labs about that exciting partnership. And maybe you could shed a little bit more light on uh, some of the big obstacles that you've seen or heard that relate to information exchange with social determinants of health situations. Absolutely. So. Uh, first is uh, the standards for this data are not fully mature yet. So we, I know, I'd like to applaud, you know, the work that, you know, the Gravity Project and the community, which I've been um, a member of since its inception in defining social risk factors, um, really outstanding work done by EMI advisors. And a lot of those recommendations that the community has made on defining things like you know, food insecurity, housing insecurity, education, education needs, these types of things that the research shows impact health outcomes. These recommendations made and these codes have been recommended and approved. And the US uh, CDI has, uh, version two has now embraced these, these codes. Uh, so there are a lot of opportunities in kind of embracing them and moving those forward. Um, <clears throat> and then also, you know, we don't have a, a common, you know, um, kind of secure mechanism for just exchanging data, whatever the contents of that package is, right? In the in the form of like that, I think this is an opportunity for direct secure messaging. You know, that as a protocol, it can serve as a mechanism both for the transmission of the structured SDOH data and for unstructured SDOH data. Um, and finally, you know, I think there's a large opportunity in terms of you know, what is the next generation of trust frameworks look like for different intersections of interoperability, right? Not all human service organizations will be able to kind of reach the level of, uh, you know, they're not all going to necessarily be kind of in the getting their HIPAA training, you know, they may not be at that level of kind of, uh, they may not have the resources to invest in that type of thing, but we still need to provide mechanisms for secure information, transportation, transmission, excuse me. Um, and 
to by making those those developing these standards and offering these standards, we make it easier for these partnerships to take place. We make it easier for human service providers to uh, find grant opportunities to address the clinical needs and coordinate care with with um, the clinical providers. So I hope that sheds some light. It does, yeah. And I think, you know, for so many of us in the, the health IT industry, as we discuss more and more health equity and social determinants of health, and we're considering how we have information exchange with community-based organizations and, and others, the thing that I liked what you said was making it easy, right? We've always been in the pursuit of easy and secure and expeditious information exchange, and we need that to extend to our community support system and, and to those entities too. So totally agree with what you said. And, and maybe could you describe um, what, uh, for lack of a better term, what does a Nirvana state look like for that information exchange sure. between uh, healthcare and human services, but then also among human services organizations themselves. So not even yeah. with, uh, with a healthcare entity, but what does that look like? Yeah, and I'd also include government agencies as well, because a lot of the very programs that human service agencies are implementing are government funded programs. Um, and they're helping people enroll in government, you know, benefits like SNAP or, you know, housing or whatever it might be. Um, so what it really looks like is, you know, kind of a comprehensive ability to exchange both ideally highly standardized data um, between all, all of these actors um, for the purposes of improving care coordination, streamlining referral, um, and streamlining eligibility and enrollments and programs while putting the patients in control of consenting to share their data. Imagine a place where you can see all of the places where you've consented to share your data across your care team, across various entities of different types. Um, and the idea would be that, you know, ideally we need to get to that place by using things like artificial intelligence and machine learning to be able to move between structured and unstructured data, right? Because, you know, the, it, it becomes burdensome for providers to be, you know, always looking for that right code, right? Um, and this being able to, to, to like identify codes within unstructured data is I think in a, in a, one opportunity. And then finally, when organizations are thinking about programs, when they're thinking about standing up a program or setting up and rolling people in programs, that they start to think about instead of just, okay, I created my website and I'm done, right? But instead of that, they're thinking about integrating into an ecosystem of care where those people can authorize their data to be used to enroll themselves in those programs. So that it, you're not talking about these siloed websites that are just kind of stood up left and right, but people can then be proactively informed about programs and services they're eligible for. An example of that is the child tax credit, which recently went into practice where the IRS is administering it and they're saying, hey, well, we know your, your income because you filed your taxes. Well, we're just gonna give you the benefit. We're gonna assume you're eligible based on the income you've provided. And then if you, if you, didn't, if you weren't eligible for the benefit, you're gonna give that money back next year, right? Um, and so that type of model where you're using existing information instead of asking people to re-enter that information again and again, is the model for improving access to programs and services. Thank you for, for outlining that too, because I think you know, we also hear about patient experience and consumer experience a lot. And so considering those facets is really important uh, for ensuring access to care. And, and we don't want barriers to get that care. And so a long lengthy process certainly could be a barrier to getting those services. Um, and I, knowing that there are so many organizations that are working on social determinants of, of health and the connection, especially between healthcare 
and community-based organizations, many different organizations out there. In general, yeah. though, <laughs> a lot. Um, in general, though, what would you say to someone who's interested in getting more information or getting involved? What What should they do? Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you want to get in touch with me directly, you can email me at matt at opencitylabs.com. Um, you can go to our website, opencitylabs.com, or follow me on Twitter, Matthew T. Bishop, or my company, Open City Labs. Um, you know, and I invite you to get involved with the standards work that, um, you know, that, you know, I'm involved with, you know, we need the participation of both the clinical side and the human service organization side. I'm involved with helping to write the implementation guide for 360X and, and um, a lot of great opportunities at information exchange for human services uh, and direct trust and uh, gravity project. So um, I encourage people to get involved in these standards efforts as well. Matt, you just outlined so, so many of them. So Matt, thank you so much for the time. Congratulations on your recognition as an interoperability hero. And to learn more about the Interoperability Hero Initiative, visit directtrust.org slash interophero, where you can find more Interop Hero Spotlight interviews like this one.